Hey book pals, I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader and this is a summary of the books that I read in the first couple weeks in August. I can officially report that the reading revolution I announced at the end of my July reading wrap-up is in full swing. Around the world, avid readers have sequestered themselves in their office breakout rooms with a book, turning work hours into day-long reading sessions. Others have barricaded themselves in their bedrooms, keeping out all those needy family members so they can finally read those books that they've always been meaning to get to. Viva la revolution! <laughs> I've been doing my bit and reading as much as I can. I've read three books so far this month and I have a lot to say about them. First up, I finished Gabriel Talent's much-anticipated debut novel called My Absolute Darling. This is about a 14-year-old girl named Julia who goes by the nickname Turtle and she lives with her single father Martin in what I think is Northern California. This novel hasn't actually been published yet. Uh, this is a proof copy. It's been published at the end of August in uh, both the US and the UK. First things first, uh, we need to talk about the cover uh, because uh, this is the US cover and then this is the UK cover. Uh, what do you prefer? Uh, personally, I much prefer the UK cover. I like that it has a moody girl on it. It's much more evocative of Turtle's character and the US cover just looks like you're sort of going on a camping trip. Uh, much of the novel does take place in the woods and there's a lot of detail about the natural world in this book, uh, but still it's really awesome. All about the girl. She's honestly one of the most powerful and striking characters I've read in a story in a long time. She's a fierce individual skilled in using a wide range of firearms. She can make a fire out of virtually nothing and she can swallow a scorpion whole. She's been trained by her father Martin who is an intellectual that reads a lot of philosophy uh, but he's also incredibly paranoid and he's a very committed survivalist. He's also a tyrant and an abuser. This this novel includes graphic and disturbing scenes of physical and sexual abuse. And what's so powerful about the way that Talent depicts this is the way he shows that Turtle turns that abuse inward so she hates herself and other women especially. She recognizes that Martin isn't right in the head uh, but at the same time she loves him and she's devoted to him hence the conflict. The story follows Turtle's journey. As she's growing older, her isolated home life becomes much more strained and intolerable. In a way, I still feel like I'm making up my mind about this book. I'm not sure quite how I feel about it. It's incredibly gripping and moving, but at the same time, the way that Talent writes is quite odd. Like in some ways, it's very realistic and very starkly realistic, but in other ways, particularly the way he shows Turtle's relationship with other people, it's slightly unreal. For instance, she has adolescent male friends who casually throw in lots of references to classic literature just casually into their conversations. In fact, there's lots of literary references throughout the book. There's also a spider in the house which Martin calls Virginia Woolf. At the same time, Talent's writing is so beautiful. He writes about the natural world in an incredible way. He gets the details of its working so exquisitely, it's like watching the most glorious David Attenborough documentary. I realize this sounds quite strange and it's difficult to describe how it all works together, but I think it does. However, I'm very eager to get other people's opinions about it. I think I think the author gets Turtle's shifting internal logic and the way that she starts to really value herself apart from anybody else's opinions of her so well. It's really powerful. I read the next two novels basically simultaneously because you know what? Erin Tati Roy's Ministry of Utmost Happiness is so densely written that I felt like I needed some relief from this very like heavy, intricate story. I buddy read this novel with the wonderful Annie who uh, has a YouTube channel called Am I Right, uh, which I'll link down below. And I am so happy that I read it alongside her. We messaged each other while we were reading it and I felt like it did so much for my sense of sanity that we could bounce our responses off from each other. Of course, I was so intrigued to read this novel, but I specifically wanted to read it now because it's on the Booker Long List. So this is Roy's first novel in 20 years 
and I feel like it shows in some ways. It can be the case sometimes that authors will work on a book over a long period of time, and as a reader you can really feel that time packed in there. F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night comes to mind. Aaron Tati Roy is also a determined political campaigner and activist who writes extensively about Indian politics. This novel includes so much about the repercussions of partition, which in case you don't know, uh, was in 1947 when India was divided into two separate nations, the Republic of India with a dominant Hindu population and Pakistan with a dominant Muslim population. And there's specifically a lot about conflicts in Kashmir, which is the northernmost part of the Indian subcontinent. But the story really surprised me at first because the first quarter of the book is about a intersect character named Anjum who has both male and female genitalia. She was raised as a boy, but in adolescence uh, she left her home and moved into a house that's full of other intersex and trans individuals. The depiction of this community was so fascinating. As the story progresses, it follows a lot of other individuals, including a woman named Tilo, a man named Musa, a baby um, who's kidnapped from a side of protest rallies, and a huge range of other characters. I was for a while making a whole list of characters, um, but I sort of stopped because it just got to be too many. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of specific references to political events and conflicts, and I won't lie to you, this will put off a lot of readers. I was having dinner with the writer Fiona Melrose and she said that she was reading this and she had to put it down after a certain point because she felt like she wasn't getting so many of the references and she was continuously having to go and look things up. And she just found this so exhausting that even though she found the writing really beautiful, she had to put it aside. And I can really understand the point of view. I mean, I would look up things now and then, uh, but on the whole, I just tried to sort of plow through the story and piece together things about larger political things that were going on that I could. And there is a lot of beautiful writing uh, with a lot of bizarre descriptions and metaphors Roy characterizes an owl as if it were a Japanese businessman at one point, and then at another point she describes a character as being like the voice of Billie Holiday, not like the woman Billie Holiday, but like her voice. It is a fascinating experience reading it, and uh, like Annie and I said to each other, we were enjoying reading it, uh, but also not enjoying it at the same time. Mostly there were times when I needed a bit of relief reading something a bit more straightforward, which is why I was reading this simultaneously. But I got to a section of Roy's novel where I think she really explains why she can't write a straightforward story. This is from one of the character's notebooks in Roy's novel. She writes, I would like to write one of those sophisticated stories in which even though nothing much happens, there's lots to write about. That can't be done in Kashmir. It's not sophisticated what happens here. There's too much blood for good literature. I think Arantati Roy really feels this way too. She's far too knowledgeable about everything that's going on in India, all its like immense history and its complicated politics, to write just a straightforward story. This novel probably isn't what you would describe as good literature in the traditional sense, uh, because the story goes all over the place. And as Annie said when we were writing to each other, I'm not sure there is really a specific story. But at the same time, I think that she's revolutionizing the form of the book to really fit with what's going on inside her head. And after all, that's what the novel is for. It keeps reinventing the form to suit the subject matter and the outlook of its author. So I did really enjoy and appreciate this novel, but it did definitely take uh, dedication, time, and patience to read it properly. Finally, I read When Light is Like Water by Molly McCloskey, and this was published a few months ago. I've been really meaning to get to it because I love Irish literature. And compared to Roy's novel, it's so easy to summarize this book. It's about a woman looking back on the dissolution of her marriage when she had an affair. That's it. <laughs> 
And yes, like uh, Roy describes, it's a sophisticated novel where not much happens um, except for what I just described. Yet it's also so psychologically insightful and evocative because she really gives a new view on that like much trodden literary subject of infidelity. She gets the inner workings of our relationships and the undercurrents of our connections with other people and just the bizarre foolishness of encounters that we have. The main character Alice is an American who moved to Ireland basically permanently and I could really sympathize with her experience as an expat um, as an American who moved to the UK. McCloskey gets her sense of estrangement and her painful heartache that's been dulled by time so well. It's in many ways a very beautiful novel. So that's what I've been reading. Uh, thank you for watching. Comment down below if you've read any of these books or if you're interested in reading any of these books. I'll um, also post links to my full reviews of them. And also let me know anything else you've been reading uh, during our August revolution of reading. I'll speak to you again soon. Um, keep fighting the good fight. Reading isn't escaping from the world, it's engaging with it on a different level. So happy reading everyone!